Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, Three Ways to Put Your Network on the LTE on-ramp, presented by Sonus. Our presenter today is Bill Welch, Product Line Manager of Diameter Solutions at Sonus. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Bill. Thank you, Kyle. Hi. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Bill Welch, uh, Product Line Manager for Diameter Solutions, and I'll be going over uh, three ways to put your network on the LTE on-ramp. So let's first talk about some operator challenges uh, and challenges the operators face. So here we find uh, operators are, are, are uh, challenged with an introduction of new technologies. So underneath that banner we have Bolti as a key technology, uh, video broadcast emerging as a uh, new technology and uh, market opportunity, uh, virtualization, uh, NFV, and SDN. Um, in, addition to, in addition to that challenge, um, the operators are also facing explosive growth on LTE and conjunction diameter. So you're seeing continued LTE subscriber growth. Um, you're seeing new policy use cases uh, being developed in order to drive overall diameter growth. And you're just starting to see um, the services uh, voice over LTE or Volti and video broadcast just starting to take off. Um, th while these challenges are going on, you also are faced with the challenge of maintaining uh, the legacy. So in the past few years, we've seen uh, a fair amount of vendor attrition uh, on the SS7 network side. Um, and then also you, you still need to maintain that network uh, because there is continued growth with 2G and 3D subscribers. Uh, and then always ever present uh, operations. Um, your customers expect an, an always on subscriber experience. Uh, and this is coupled with the financials of flat revenues uh, versus ever increasing OpEx. Um, and then when you're, when you're talking about a signaling network, um, you are potentially talking about a media worthy event if you have a problem. Um, and so if your, your signaling goes down, uh, generally your services go down. Uh, and your network goes down and then customers are quite upset and this could put you into the press, the blogosphere, or in potentially in front of a regulator uh, with fines. Um, in the upper right hand corner, uh, we're showing you the, the relative trends coming from GSA regarding uh, the total number of, of subscribers on 2G, 3G, and 4G technologies uh, in the wireless domain. Um, in addition to that, in that same area, we're showing, the, showing you the relative growth of First LTE, you know, dating back from 2009, um, with two two networks deployed, and then now in 2014, uh, well over 350 uh, networks deployed with LTE, um, and then now, uh, most recently in the last couple of years, um, you know, 2012 to 2014, you're just starting to see the first couple of operators uh, deploy and uh, launch Bolti, uh, and they're doing this uh, in limited markets and eventually trying to penetrate this through their entire footprint. Um, and that's basically kind of showing the subscriber and kind of service growth there. Um, and then that subscriber and service growth is also, also translated into the chart below, uh, which is showing you uh, an uh, Infonetics report uh, regarding the, the total uh, revenue for uh, diameter routing um, and also the total transactions for second licenses that are out there. And so this is uh, very much a hockey stick. And as services and subscribers grow on the 4G network, uh, so correspondingly, the uh, diameter traffic and total uh, total market uh, for diameter routing uh, grow. So moving on, let's focus in a little bit more on some details of what service providers want. Um, so service providers uh, looking for solutions, are diameter-based solutions that are essentially essentially the services, um, and they see basically SDN and NFV as key technologies to increase their service velocity and lower overall cost. Um, again, on the bottom, you see the Infonetics report regarding um, the, the, the diameter routing mar uh, total addressable market and um, transactions for second licenses. But more importantly, off to the right, we're showing you a uh, Infonetics report regarding what, um, what uh, operators are looking to get out of NFB and what, in particular, what are, they, what are their things that are first looking uh, uh, or evaluating NFB for. And so what we show here is a relative timelines of you know high importance to to kind of lower importance, 
and we're, we're highlighting here the mobile core as, as a um, something that some operators are looking for to do in the in the 2014 to 2015 range, but certainly uh, 2016 and after is where things really get busy on virtualizing the uh, EPC or, or mobile core. And so uh, diameter basically being a component of that, and in particular diameter routing. Moving on to the next slide, and so what what a service for us, What do they want from NFE and SDN? Um, and here is basically what their NF, NFV uh, deployment drivers are. Um, their number one uh, and number two items uh, on deployment drivers for NFV is, is they essentially want to scale services up and down quickly. So as subscribers and popularity of services grow, um, they can scale it up and scale down to meet demands. Um, and they're looking to use uh, you know, software rather than either hardware or hardware, uh, hardware enabled uh, software. Um, for, for uh, quick time to revenue. And so they're looking to kind of lower the time it takes to, you know, acquire new, new capabilities, new equipment, um, in particular, you know, rather than sourcing some hardware and then basically installing and testing, getting out there in the network, uh, it would basically be a quick download software load, software download, validate basically the solution that they're looking to do with some technology and then roll it out, out with quicker time to revenue. Um, and then uh, the importance of NS, uh, SDN and NFE applications for producing new revenue uh, versus a saving, you know, OpEx and, and CapEx. Um, these are the use cases they're looking at off to the right-hand side. So bandwidth on demand are, are kind of top of mind uh, for operators. Um, they're looking to uh, create, you know, dynamic policy and pricing, uh, very much, uh, you know, PCRF-based type scenarios. Uh, and uh, the last one here is el uh, elastic service chaining. And so the ability to kind of pull together different types of uh, technology components and, and um, to chain services together in, in sort of an elastic way or, or in a dynamic way. And so these are both reports coming from Infinetics um, based on, uh, you know, operators, in particular mobile operators uh, that are looking to deploy NFE and, and SDN. So moving on, um, just some quick history here. You know, what is diameter? So diameter is basically an IETF uh, defined protocol originally designed for authentication, authorization, and accounting. Um, and it was a, a wholesale improvement over RADIUS. Um, and so it has improved uh, failure handling. Uh, it uses a more reliable message delivery uh, protocol. Um, it supports bigger information elements and, uh, and attributes. It has improved security. Uh, it is uh, much more extensible. Uh, than RADIUS, um, and it's more flexible in discovering uh, nodes and, and node capability. Um, and so, you know, diameter being twice a RADIUS, it, it's you know, supposed to be uh, doubly as fun and doubly capable, and the diameter protocol is certainly the, at the core of signaling networks, uh, 4G uh, signaling networks. In addition to that, um, there's the SIP protocol, and so uh, 3GBP makes uh, use of the SIP protocol um, for basically initiating sessions and, and used to set up IMS sessions, um, you know, within the network. And diameter, uh, diameter is used within the uh, EPC or, or enhanced packet core, and IMS is used for the transactional events. Um, and so both protocols are essentially uh, critical elements uh, within the signaling uh, and transport part of your network, um, and, and, and these are uh, important uh, important protocols uh, regarding, you know, rolling out LTE uh, and particularly uh, Volte. Moving on, so let's talk briefly about what a diameter router is. And so what a diameter router is, is it's essentially a, uh, a traffic control uh, capability. Uh, it's going to provide you aggregation, uh, centralization of routing and load balancing. And so if you look in the upper left-hand corner, um, in sort of the core routing and DRA function, um, you have sort of the, 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 you know, the N squared problem um, where every time you add a node to the network, such as a, you know, a P gateway, a GGSN, an MME, whatever the, the element may be, um, that's uh, transporting uh, messages and it needs to interconnect and talk to those different elements, um, you're m multiplying it out uh, in a squared model. Um, and this creates sort of a fanning effect. Uh, so you can certainly use uh, a diameter router to centralize all that traffic and control it. Um, 
In addition, uh, a diameter router can be used as a diameter edge agent, or DEA, in the upper right-hand corner. And that is essentially providing uh, security, routing, and protocol interworking. And this is where you have two mobile operators you know, uh, working between themselves, uh, between the two of them, in order to provide a, a roaming service. And so you, on the left-hand side, you have the, the visited P PMN, and you have the home PNN uh, network. And so you're, you know, you're roaming, uh, tra traveling to some other uh, you know, city and or country, uh, popping up in that network and roaming into that, that network, and um, the diameter edge agent is essentially securing the interconnect, uh, the diameter interconnect between those, uh, those two networks. In addition to those types of functions, uh, what, what else does a diameter router do? Um, interworking. Um, so the uh, diameter, diameter router, a key element of that is basically a diameter to SS7 interworking, uh, or it's you know, diameter to map uh, protocol under SS7. Uh, and the last capability is, a, is an interoperability uh, capability. So um, as we know, there's a multitude of vendors out there, and not, uh, not all operators use a single vendor for their entire network. It, uh, economically and, and technology-wise, technology uh, may not work. Um, and so operators are usually uh, operating multi-vendor networks. And so you may have um, you know, protocol variances based on the vendors implementing uh, specs slightly differently uh, and or uh, you know, certain elements uh, using older specs, such as like say older versions of 3GPP specs, um, and you need to kind of bridge the gaps between them. Um, and so th this interoperability capability within a diameter router gives you the ability to kind of smooth out any interoperability you may have um, between vendors and, and or revisions in your network. And so moving on into sort of functions and use cases of what a diameter router does. And so the following network functions have been defined by, whoop, sorry about that, have been defined by 3GBP and GSMA. Um, so we have the subscriber lo location function, um, and that's essentially, I like to call it uh, solving the, the where's Waldo problem. Um, you have a translation function, um, a diameter router, and a load balancer. And so all those functions uh, have basically uh, been defined, and then they're normally incorporated into a, a diameter uh, routing solution. And so let's go into um, them in a little bit more detail. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so the proxy diameter routing agent, um, so the, the, the DRA, um, and so that's used for, for routing to multiple PCRFs, and this is the, the where is Waldo problem I, I was referring to. Um, so in a network, um, you have uh, you know, subscribers that are attached to your network, they have access sessions, uh, known as PDN sessions, or you know, also known as IPCAN sessions. And they are essentially, uh, those sessions are terminated on a P gateway, um, and they're managed by a particular PCRF. And so uh, if you ever have a, um, you know, IMS layer or application layer um, request to modify that, that access session with different quality of service parameters or, or, or such, um, you have to find them in your network. They're, you know, you could have, you know, tens or maybe even a hundred, you know, different PCRF blades that you're, you're working with. Um, and potentially 10 to 50 or 100 um, P gateways, depending on your scale. And so that particular, uh, you know, request from an application layer needs to be, um, you know, found in the network and associated with the appropriate PCRF and P gateway. Um, and that's essentially what the, uh, the DRA uh, function is doing. It's providing a, you know, stateful routing capability, where as the, the access sessions, the IPCAN sessions come up, um, sessions, uh, additional diameter uh, messages that need to be processed by the same PCRF are routed to the, to the appropriate PCRF. Uh, so it's sort of a stateful load balancing solution. Um, in addition to that, you have the proxy agent. This is for, for routing to multiple OCSs and OC, OFCS agents. This is for uh, messages related to charging. And, um, you know, with these capabilities, uh, we are, you know, it's all about network path aggregation. You know, centralizing routing and providing PCRF, you know, binding, uh, you know, in a stateful way, and load balancing. So moving on. So the diameter edge agent, the diameter edge agent. So this is a, a single point of entry uh, in the di diameter uh, into the core network. 
So as mentioned before, you're in a visited network. Uh, you know, normally you're in your home network, but then you're visited network. You're traveling to a different city or or, or a different country, um, and you're either doing a you know an LTE to LTE roaming or potentially LTE to 2G, 3G roaming. Um, and so the diameter edge agent uh, in this scenario will provide you know screening and routing functions, you know essential security capabilities, um, topology hiding. So as you're adding network elements, you know either in the visited network or the home network. Um, you don't have to communicate those changes to the other operator and you know that's kind of insulating um, and hiding your topology um, and allowing you to kind of operate freely without uh, creating all sorts of linkages of, of sort of shared configurations between operators. Um, and then finally um, congestion and flow control uh, which is important. Um, you may have one you know roaming partner that you're dealing with that may be having some problems in their network and then that those uh, those problems are actually spilling over into your network, uh, into your home network, and you don't want one roaming partner having some issues uh, within their signaling network, in particular the di diameter parts of their, uh, their network, actually causing you problems for your other uh, you know, potential customers coming on different roaming partners. And so you want to be able to handle that congestion and flow control uh, and security to make sure uh, you can insulate and isolate uh, any problems that emerge. And so that's what's... Um, Essentially, a diameter edge agent is uh, is facilitating here, uh, you know, roaming traffic between operators. And so we have the subscriber location function, um, and this is used uh, basically uh, to help scale up. And I apologize for that. Help scale up um, HSSs. Um, so you have a problem uh, in a network where you have you know very large subscriber databases uh, HSSs. And um, either due to you know software limitations, hardware limitations, you know, or kind of geo redundancy considerations, uh, you may take your your HSSs and divide them up uh, and segment them in, in, in some way. Um, they could be completely kind of distributed, um, and you know it's sort of randomly assigned to you know HSS complex one versus two, um, you know, or they could be broken up in some sort of logical way. And so you need a, a subscriber location function. Um, which is essentially a database to then map you to the appropriate HSS when requests come in. Um, so it's, you know, requests are basically coming in from the MME or P-Gateway or other elements, um, and they're looking for a particular subscriber. You're doing a small kind of database dip and or kind of, uh, you know, routing logic um, to then f uh, route the, the traffic to the appropriate HSS. And um, as mentioned before, you do this for redundancy reasons. It may be done uh, either because of scaling problems of particular hardware on the HSS, um, either on the query side or potentially provisioning side. Um, and then you're ultimately trying to do is make your, your entire network more resilient or more redundant, where if you start to have problems on one HSS, they don't necessarily impact the others. Um, and so this is a, a key element in sort of scaling uh, capability that many operators take advantage of to improve their uptime uh, and, and improve overall performance of, of their network. So moving on. Sorry about that. Um, so the translation function into, into working. Um, we mentioned this before. Um, so into working between MAP, uh, SS7, and diameter interfaces. And so there's a there's a spec coming out of 3GPP, um, and you're essentially mapping you know diameter into MAP. Um, and this is TS29805, um, and this is used for when you know you have 4G uh, handsets, 4G phones, you know L LTE phones that are you know normally would connect to an LTE network, but they're you know they're out of range, there isn't a local tower, um, they're roaming to some other country or whatever it may be. Um, they only have access to 2G and, and 3G as kind of a fallback, and so you have to take that you know authentication message coming. You know, for the 4G side, and then translate it, you know, over to the 2G, 3G side uh, via uh, from diameter to map, and so that's a a, a main capability. Uh, you certainly don't have you know LTE ubiqu ubiquity around the globe, and um, and you need to uh, allow customers kind of a fallback service in case either the LTE network you know isn't available in that location, um, or they just happen to be roaming to a country that you know that hasn't been launched yet. Um, you know, or there is some issue um, on the on the LTE side. Um, and then the last one here 
is the diameter protocol normalization interoperability. And this is just straight kind of diameter to diameter, you know, protocol variance and interoperability. And this, again, insulates you from, you know, vendor differences. Um, you know, not all specs are basically created equal and not all specs are interpreted in the same exact manner. And so there might, might be some vendor nuance and sort of misinterpretation or slight incompatibilities that may uh, emerge, you know, between vendors of different products um, in your network. And so you can use that, um, you know, diameter capability uh, in the router to smooth out those differences and, and continue to make your network work without necessarily waiting for patches, fixes, or, or changes, um, you know, from the end vendors. You can kind of you know, manipulate the overall diameter messages in a way that allows uh, the, the, two, uh, the two boxes to talk. So that's a, just a quick, you know, dive into sort of some of the main capabilities of what a diameter router does and, you know, how it's applied in the network. And we're going to kind of go into a slightly different direction uh, from this point forward. And so that was really all about the basics. Um, and let's, let's focus beyond the basics. Oops, sorry about that. Beyond the basics and talk about security, virtualization, and a common platform and SPC integration. So, sorry about that again. Um, so, service assurance and security essentials. Um, so these are uh, three, you know, elements uh, within an overall diameter and, and DSE uh, element solution that are, are key to basically make, you know, the entire network work. Uh, they work very much hand in hand or, and, are, and are, are layered together. So you start from left to right. You know, we have security at the mobile edge, and that's really securing your network access. Um, you have system availability, and you really need uh, carrier grade reliability to make that happen. And operationally, uh, you need you know SLA provisioning and monitoring. And so elements underneath that on the security side at the edge are topology hiding, you know DOS and DDoS protection. Uh, you definitely need encryption at, at high scale, and you need the capability to do message screening to kind of keep the, the good messages in, the bad messages out. Um, depending on uh, you know what's happening in your network, um, then on the on the carry grade reliability side, uh, you certainly need high availability. Uh, you want to be able to deploy your network and network elements in a geo redundant scenario for disaster recovery and failover in case there is some you know seismic event, um, you know uh, you know fire, a flood, whatever it may be, uh, something that's really un uh, you know uncontrollable from a, a physical plant perspective. Um, and, you know, you need to basically uh, a critical data path protection. And, you know, finally, the, the, the system itself needs to support in-service software upgrades. And so that's a, a critical element to, to achieve system availability. And then finally, off to the right here on the operational side, you need to assure that, you know, you're reaching your, your, your service level agreements. Um, so you need SLA assurance. Um, and in order to achieve that, you know, things like congestion management, and sort of functional prioritization of prioritizing, you know, one message over another and creating access controls where you're keeping, you know, the good from the bad and, um, you know, and, and keeping any sort of, uh, any uh, bad scenarios out is, is important. And so, you know, all three of these elements are critical to basically make your services work. Um, they aren't necessarily the feature sets that, that make things happen, but they're certainly kind of the supporting infrastructure that then allow your network to, to, to work properly. Um, and uh, stay up and operational. And so let's talk about flexible deployment models, and this is really the heart of part of the discussion I wanted to get to. So what we're introducing, it's a, it's a, here in the uh, today or tomorrow, is uh, we're introducing essentially a um, a diameter and SS7 SIGTRAN solution uh, embedded on top of a of an SPC platform. And so you see that at the bottom. Um, for a long time, uh, first performance technologies and then uh, Sonus Networks um, have had a, a purpose-built hardware for our SS7 um, and diameter solution, and that's our, our DSC 8000. Um, and that's basically a core routing SS7 and diameter solution. Um, last fall uh, into the winter, we uh, launched basically DSC SWE, uh, a virtual offering. Um, and that's basically designed for the data center and the cloud. It comes with the same capabilities um, as, the, as the hardware. Um, and then what we did was we took that same kind of software-only option um, and then imported it and embedded it 
uh, within our, our SPC platforms. And so you, you, with that last one there, you essentially get an integrated edge. Um, and so you have a network edge and interconnect there um, between SIP, SIP and essentially diameter. And so one of the key things that we do um, you know, here at Sonus is uh, we take a, you know, a single common code base, um, that essentially the DSC software, and we apply it to our different platforms. And so that gives you know, commonality of interfaces, you know, integration with other elements, um, and common feature sets for customers. And that helps lower overall uh, you know, operational costs uh, with customers if they start with, say, one solution, and then they maybe migrate uh, to a different one. Um, or if they happen to have you know, a multitude of different uh, platforms deployed, um, they can essentially uh, look and, and smell the same um, you know, from, a, from an operational standpoint. And so this helps us uh, at Sonus, um, where we can you know, leverage our investments you know, out into the marketplace, but it also helps customers you know, leverage their investment in, in our, our, our technology um, and also operationalize that in particular um, uh, as they build, build it into their network and their, and their network, network operations. So moving on. So what, what are we talking about? Uh, about an integrated, uh, integrated and diameter edge. Um, and so what we've done is we've, we've taken um, you know, the, the SBC uh, platform from, uh, from Sonus um, you know, our SPC, uh, you know, 5100, um, 5200s, and, and 7000s, and we're, and these two basically share a fair amount of common capabilities um, between SIP and diameter. So, you know, across SIP and diameter, you see things like topology hiding, you know, security and screening, interworking, you know, and traffic management regarding routing and flow control and, and congestion. And so, since you know both of these protocols and the elements uh, and and uh, and solutions that support it have very similar uh, similarities there as far as what 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 is the function and, and where in the network they, they exist. Um, it made sense to go ahead and co-locate co them um, on the SPC platform, and that was really the, the motivation for integration uh, between the two. So let's just kind of diagram it up at what it would look like in an operator. Um, Sorry about that. Um, so, it, so if you take a look at the top here, uh, what we're talking about is, is securing the edge. So you have, you know, a purpose-built, you know, DEA, you know, out and deployed on Service Rider One, on the left-hand side, and they also have kind of a companion SPC um, taking care of SIP. And so you have kind of a SIP interconnect point and a diameter interconnect point between the two service providers, just to f facilitate, you know, roaming, LTE roaming in particular, but most importantly, uh, Volte. And then what, what we're talking about is actually integrating essentially the edge DA agent and capabilities within the SBC. And so you essentially get a, a hosted purpose-built hardware and or virtual appliance. Um, and so this is going to do a, a number of things that we'll outline here in the, in the, in the coming pages. But it's probably most important to talk about just the simplification of, of the overall interconnect model. Um, you're, you're potentially eliminating, uh, you know, inter different types of interconnect and different IP and transport networks to support the diameter and SIP separately, and you're just combining that. And this is going to really simplify, you know, your inter interconnect, uh, basically points, potentially transport costs between, you know, um, between the two uh, service providers, and certainly operationally, uh, you know, less ports, less configuration, less, less um, kind of rack space. Let's move on to the next slide. We'll kind of cover some of these common common platform advantages. And so, what what we're really talking about is a is a is a um, a SIGTRAN uh, map SS7 capability, um, a diameter, a full blown diameter capability, um, and uh, you know an SPC uh, capability with SIP. And so you're taking these. Um, you know, connectivity interworking between the 2G and 3G domains with the uh, map interworking. Um, you're securing the, the 4G roaming interconnect points um, in core routing, and you're doing, you know, via the SPC, you're doing real-time communications with interworking and firewall. And so that coupled together, um, the the advantage you get from that is you have a, you know, essentially a single point of entry at the mobile edge. Um, and as I pointed out before, and what we're talking about there is is the associated, you know. Uh, Ethernet ports and, and TDM ports and, and the like, um, and the interconnect of those um, 
and then also um, you know the, the the IP transport you know in or, uh, in and around that. Um, you have seamless support of technology migration. So we, we all know that signaling networks are, are very much you know evolution versus revolution. Um, in that first slide there, I showed you very much a long tail of 2G and 3G subscribers, you know, pointing out to 2020. And, you know, latest market projections were we really expect, you know, the SS7 network to keep humming along um, overall probably, you know, down to, to 2030. Um, and so this thing's going to be out there and working and, and working on behalf of you um, for, for quite a quite amount of time. Um, and so this long tail of essentially migration um, from SS7 um, and then introducing diameter uh, to roll out LTE, and then really introducing SIP as you're going to Volte. Um, this, you know, this type of a common platform approach has has an advantage to to support that migration through that very much you know long, long timeline. Um, with our solution, we also have uh, unified install and management. Um, so you have a, a common management framework, uh, essentially an EMS. Um, which would then manage both the, the SPC side and also the, the SS7 and diameter sides. Um, and as mentioned before, you have simplified network topology that's laid out you know, through uh, you know, eliminating boxes and interconnect. And, um, and as mentioned before, a unified overall management between the two. So let me just point out here, we, um, our integrated signaling solution has gotten some notoriety. Um, so we're essentially introducing this. Um, you'll see this on our website, and you'll see it, um, you know, announced in press releases. You know, we're introducing the EDSC, um, which is essentially the, you know, the, the converged SIP, SS7, and diameter solution for LTE and Volte networks. Um, back in um, back last year into late 2014, uh, during uh, an LTE North America uh, session, uh, we got an award as a, a best Volte innovation. Um, and I'm also just pointing out that um, you know the Sonus EMS um, has been around for you know quite a long period of time, um, and it's been managing you know our uh, trunking portfolio and our policy portfolio and also our SP, SBC portfolio, and those you know underlying investments and capabilities are, are essentially being leveraged um, as we integrate the DSC uh, with that existing EMS. Uh, so we have a long history of investing uh, in our EMS to support our customers. Uh, with capabilities, and we'll, we'll uh, leverage all that investment uh, with some new integration uh, specific to the DSC device. And so, what 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 is this? What does it look like from a platform perspective? Um, and so, these are the 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 what what does the ES, EDSC run on? Um, and so, these are essentially the the Sonus platforms, the Sonus SPC platforms that it runs on. Um, they have the 5110. The SPC uh, 5200, the 5210, and the 7000, and I'm showing you, uh, you know, relative information uh, regarding the number of, you know, SPC sessions they handle, um, you know, across those different platforms. So that's really kind of the the SIP side. Um, and then what it is is there's, um, you know, a virtual container that is available on top of that, on top of those platforms, and that is essentially the container we're using to then run the the DSC application. And what it is is we haven't fully done performance tests yet, and we're not really prepared to share that with, uh, you know, uh, sort of in a public forum. And so what we have is sort of relative performance here displayed. We have, you know, two CPU cores that are available for uh, DSC, six CPU cores uh, on the 5200 and 5210, and 16 core CPUs uh, on the 7000. Now, when we make this available and we talk about performance, um, these are uh, the, these particular hardware platforms have a, a fair amount of, uh, of headroom and capability, so they can handle you know very easily handle those 10,000 sessions and not see any any degradation um, on the on the SPC side um, while concurrently supporting traffic uh, on the DSC side. And so we have kind of a you know uh, you know a kind of a roadmap where we're, you know we're adding SIP diameter SS7 and interworking all all together, and these are really, you know, for you know, wireless providers, fixed providers, and IP exchange carriers. And so let's just do a, a recap um, on what we're talking. What are the? Oops, sorry about that. Uh, recap um, uh, of the essential components uh, uh, of features on the DSE. And so 
flexible deployment options. You know, we can check that off. You know, we have you know a hardware-based appliance. Um, you know, as a, an SS7 and and uh, SS7 and, and diameter option. Um, we have basically our our software-only uh, option uh, coming from Sonus, our, our DSC SWE, and that's essentially can run on top of a, a KVM hypervisor and you know other hypervisors in the future. Um, and then we have the, the EDSC, which is essentially an integrated, you know, option um, uh, on top of our SBC. Uh, you know, all of these are, are, are you know, are, have been hardened over time. We've had a, you know, long history of delivering, you know, 15 plus year delivering signaling solutions to the market. And all that carrier hard, hardening that's been go gone on over those last 15 years, you know, primarily uh, with, um, with SS7 networks, but more recently with diameter networks. Uh, that is leveraged across all all three of those of those uh, flexible deployment uh, options and or platforms. Um, we have some virtual virtualization capabilities, so you can virtualize the applications themselves. You know to run you know multiple instances and, and stand up those instances for different reasons, but also um, you know internal to a, a particular node, um, in, in particular instance, you can virtualize that off uh, virtualize that offering. Um, and so what I mean by that is, is you can set up, you know, multiple internal uh, virtual instances, and this is a kind of a proprietary, you know, internal thing, and then set up, uh, you know, multiple different routing tables and call screening tables um, to, to provide different services for different either customers uh, and or uh, subscribers. And so this type of virtualization, particularly the internal virtualization, is seen as a key capability uh, for folks in the IP exchange carrier space. Um, we talked about the protocol interworking and you know being able to take inbound messages and modify them and, and, and change them in order to, to kind of smooth over interop interoperability issues. Um, and you know within our, our, our particular uh, you know framework uh, regarding you know SS7 signaling and diameter signaling, um, we have this common platform of sens sensibility. So we have the ability to kind of call out, you know, pull in either uh, on on box. Um, you know additional functions such as subscriber location that you know we're delivering, and potentially you know uh, pulling in other applications um, such as like SMS control and other things uh, that you know have yet to be defined or are available from other other vendors. Um, and then uh, security is all, always ever present when we're dealing with the interconnects between the providers and making sure that you know the threats either in the network, uh, internal to the network, or across networks are are being taken care of. And so, just a, some key messages here. Um, you know, Sonus is investing to enable service provider evolution, um, and so we're working to support new services. You know, uh, UC collaboration. You know, Volti. Uh, we're supporting network evolution, and we're really trying to basically ease simplicity and uh, create simplicity and have ease of use. And so, all of these are, are key investment areas for for Sonus going forward. And so, just a quick recap on our, our on our portfolio. Um, you know, the Sonus uh, Sonus basically uh, DSC 8000 is is a hardware option. It's essentially an integrated hardware and software solution, SDP and, and DSC. Um, you know, it's resilient, redundant, and you essentially have up to 10 routing blades. Um, in addition to that, you can take those uh, singular systems and and basically manage them as a you know kind of a head end or or you know master shelf. And then associated shelves, uh, and you're basically taking those multiple shelves and managing them at one. And so you have the ability to kind of scale that up, um, you know, within a rack or cross racks up to up to 46 routing blades. Um, we have our Sonus eDSC, which we're introducing now, and so that's the embedded DSC on the SPC, same proven software, and it's really designed for the edge of networks, uh, bringing together you know SIP and, and diameter. And then we have our our Sonus DSC SWE, you know, it's a virtualized DSC. It's the same proven software, and it's really designed for you know very low scale to very high scale, um, and, uh, and and again that was introduced last year. And so we have you know single shelf, multi shelf, SPC embedded, you know or hypervisor options that, that allow you to you know invest in and leverage you know into the future. And so let's talk quickly uh, about the Telly Scenario case study. Here's a customer of ours, uh, an international carrier, the, the Telecenter International Arm, um, where they're basically looking to uh, route uh, 4G roaming traffic. 
And so they, they were a very early customer of ours. Uh, and this case study is available on our website. I have the link there, but you could certainly pull it up in a, in a multitude of different ways. And the, the key element uh, that they looked for uh, from us was actually that interworking between uh, LTE um, and SS7. And so why would, why would customers basically you know, come to Sonus uh, for their signaling uh, in real time uh, you know, capabilities? And so we're taking applications and embedding them into real time communications. And you know, over the last couple of years, we've been really leading the effort in virtualization. We've had a whole series of products that have been virtualized uh, in the communication space. And we're, and we're not done there. We're, we're, we're uh, working to, uh, for, for our next you know, sort of round of virtualization, which is to take a look at things like NFV and cloud. Um, and we're already embedded in, in the world's largest service providers out there, service provider voice networks. And so our, our DNA at its core is security, policy, interworking, and scale. And it's ever increasingly relevant for the future. And so just some key takeaways uh, regarding the LTE on-ramp. Um, you know, an integrated SIP diameter and SS7 solution really eases the, the signaling evolution. Um, as I showed in that first chart, um, you know, the SS7 network's not going away. You're introducing new services and, and new access such as uh, Volte and, and, and LTE. Um, and you really need to kind of make sure that those things uh, stand up. Uh, and you roll out the new services and capabilities and allow it to evolve and re you know no operators basically rip and replacing and just standing one thing up and, and shutting something down. Another key um, key thing that, that operators should look for is essentially a common code base and platform choice. Um, th this is important. Um, the, in, in the past there's been you know individual vendors you know that uh, you know com come at it and look at it they're a SIP only vendor, they're a diameter only vendor, they're an SS7 only vendor, um, and their investments that they make um, aren't leverageable uh, for them and also their customers. Um, and so you're really looking for a common code base and common platform to really um, you know, uh, make sure that the investments you are making kind of stand the test of time and the uh, investments uh, in, the, in, in the business case really work you know, both for you and, and the, the equipment provider. And then, you know, another key element here is, is we can't forget about SS7. Um, you know, uh, Sonus has basically virtualized SS7 both within our SWE product and our EDSE product. Um, and it's important to basically pull those legacy, you know, SS7 uh, signaling networks into the IP -centric, uh, IT centric network of the future uh, in and around the data center. Um, these things are going to be around, you know, it's, it's 2015 now and, you know, I was talking about these th things being live and available and, and, and supporting customers, um, you know, in, in many countries, you know, out to, uh, out to 2030. Uh, so you have to continue to take a look at uh, making that uh, a key, key thinking to make sure that you don't end up with either vendor attrition and or kind of stagnation um, within the, these systems uh, and you want a vendor that's basically, uh, you know, pulling uh, these legacy technologies, you know, into the IT-centric network in the future. Okay, Kyle, I think that is it. All right, great. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we've had a, a number of questions come in, and again, everyone in the audience, if you have any questions, please submit them in the questions tab, and we will uh, try and get to them. So the first one we had come in, Bill. Are the capabilities you discussed, topology hiding, security screening, interworking, and traffic management more or less complex in a virtualized world? Um, the base, so the, the, the base functionality uh, of actually doing those, uh, those capabilities are, are not uh, in, a, in a virtualized world. Uh, for us, it was, a, it was a very much a, um, a straight port. Um, where things do get complicated and may um, require a, a fair amount of thinking both from the network vendor and um, uh, the operator is when you're uh, scaling the, those types of capabilities up and down. Uh, you know, you're adding a particular, you know, MME element to the network or you're, um, you know, you're taking a P gateway and essentially virtualizing it and then, you know, adding, you know, four more servers in there or, you know, ten more cores to make it more capable. Well, you need to make sure that you have the appropriate configuration and or um, calculations done to then protect it 
um, and you know do things like congestion management and like on, a, on an ever bigger kind of P gateway. And so things are going to get more complicated um, with, with NFV, uh, you know, out there and lurking in particular when you're scaling up and scaling down in a dynamic way. Um, and it all comes down to um, you know uh, making that happen in, in a coordinated way across all your data elements. Um, and it's going to start with relatively small use cases as, as most things happen within uh, operators um, and, uh, and you, you build upon that experience uh, and, and then eventually uh, you know, fully grow your capabilities. Great. Uh, next question we, we had come in. Can you expand a little on how a combined DSC SBC can simplify a technology migration? Sure, sure things. You have a um, there's going to be a natural migration, you know, starting with a, an SS7 network, um, you know, and then you know, uh, adding in an LTE network. You know, so if you start with a 2G, 3G network, you're, you know, you're SS7 based, and then you uh, you know add your LTE network, um, then you're going to need need diameter, um, and then if your LTE network is then stood up to to support Volte and start to really turn down those legacy SS7 you know, kind of voice connection oriented services um, and migrate them over over to SIP, um, th then, you know, the, the, the SPC portion comes in to support the, 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 the SIP sessions. And so that one, you know, uh, platform really, you know, contains all the critical elements uh, regarding your, uh, you know, traffic management uh, of signaling, uh, both for diameter SS7 and, and SIP. Um, and could easily, uh, you know, allow it to migrate versus having to go out and source different, you know, boxes and capabilities. It's all all under one shop. All right, very interesting. Um, so another question we had come in: How does a virtualized DSC redundancy work for a greenfield deployment? Um, so. One, so one of the things regarding you know NFV um, uh, to, to think about in, in, in a virtualized scenario, um, pre you know in, in my prior life I used to work for uh, you know very much a hardware focused vendor and they would spend a large amount of their time coming up with very proprietary and very specific um, hardware based solutions um, in order to basically you know to make you know SLAs and uptime and five nines and that sort of thing um, within a virtualized world. Um, you need to kind of stay away from that. That's you know you're trying to create a networking environment and you know server hardware environment, um, very generic and, and very you know relatively clean, um, and not having uh, too many proprietary kind of capabilities you know underlying to then support you know services. And so really the smart what I'm really trying to say is a lot of that previous intelligence and capabilities on the hardware side that you see from telecom vendors has to be migrated up. And essentially put into the software, and so the software has to be much more robust on no longer relying on the underlying hardware to tell it when failures are happening um, with individual hardware components, but also, you know, sensing and reacting to communication failures on network elements that aren't necessarily, you know, it's directly on, and so that's the, that's the critical element um, in order to make um, those happen, you know, and uh, you know, sort of uh, call it a philosophy. Um, and you know, underlying technology uh, is is basically you know, you know, usually proprietary state sharing um, between different you know diameter elements in order to make sure that you know the load balancing um, and failover happen correctly, uh, in in particularly sort of a geo redundant capability. That's great. Um, so the next question we had come in, uh, we just have a couple left. Again, if anyone has any questions. Uh, please submit them, um, and we'll get to them. So the next one coming in, does the Sonos virtualized DSC provide the same functionality as your hardware-based solution? Uh, good question. Um, I kind of glossed over that a little bit. Um, so our um, Sonos uh, DSC SWE uh, currently does not support um, TDM and ATM interconnect. Um, so if you, we, you required that, you know, in particular for an SS7, uh, you know, STP type deployment, um, you really would uh, require, um, you know, the DSC 8000. Um, but if you had all your your STP, you know, SS7 links were IP based or SIGTRAN based, 
You could certainly use um, the DSC SWE, um, and you could certainly use the two products in combination where you're using the DSC 8000 as uh, pretty much kind of a signaling gateway to convert you know, SS7 traffic over to SIGTRAN, and then doing all the STP processing um, on the SWE. And so th those are all uh, a good question and, um, and, and available options to customers depending on exactly th their exact um, you know, interconnect and uh, signaling requirements. All right, great, thanks. Uh, another question we had come in, what does LTE result in an increase in diameter signaling traffic and an increase in the complexity of the traffic? So, so, so the, the LTE really basically took off and, and, and uh, or excuse me, diameter really took off, you know, as LTE got deployed. It is the main signaling protocol, you know, in a diameter network, um, excuse me, is the main signaling protocol in an LTE network. Um, and, uh, and what, what you start off with is, you know, very basic, you know, use cases um, that, you know, cause diameter traffic to happen. So, um, you know, things such as just basic mobility. You know, you're driving around, you know, you're either walking around and going from cell tower to cell tower, or you're driving, you know, to work, from work, whatever, you know, 45, 50 miles an hour, um, and you're transitioning. And, and all that transitioning from tower to tower, um, you know, causes mobility traffic to happen. And, and that mobility uh, tra traffic, uh, as far as you know, signaling where you are in the network so you can send and receive calls and receive data, um, is done via diameter. Um, that, that's a pretty basic scenario. Um, also, you know, you have, you know, LTE and, and Volte kind of roaming services, um, uh, you know, coming about, and that's really, uh, you know, adding some traffic. You know, the, the mobility traffic is relatively small, the, Vol the Volte uh, traffic is relatively small at this point, and the mobility traffic is relatively small. Where are you finding the most complexity um, regarding diameter and really where, it, you know, the diameter traffic ramps? Is, is in the policy and charging elements. Um, and so, in particular, you know, you see things like, um, you know, rollover where, you know, your, your quota for the month basically uh, becomes available month to month and it's not eliminated. Um, tiered service plans, um, things such as like, you know, Skype or, um, you know, say YouTube or, you know, Facebook are free and, all, you know, all other things go into your data plans. Um, you know, there, there are countries in the world where um, it's a very competitive marketplace um, and so there's a lot of competition for, for customers and there's, you know, things, very complex rating plans um, and, and sort of, you know, the sort of uh, you know, family plans and then also uh, very complex couponing. So you walk into a coffee shop and you may get a coupon for, you know, five megabits, to, you know, uh, from, from your operator. Um, and uh, and, and so uh, depending on the level of complexity of services and how those services rolled out, that can create a, a fair amount of interaction with your subscriber database, your P-Gateway, um, and, and your PCRF in particular, and, and all that traffic is diameter-based. All right. Um, Bill, looks like we have just time for just one more question. What new opportunities for service innovation does diameter signaling open up for operators? Sure. Uh, I, I mentioned it uh, in there in the beginning. Um, so, uh, you know, probably 10 to 15 years ago, uh, the, the big buzz uh, around, you know, uh, wireline networking was, was the triple play networks. You know, you had folks like the cable operators, you know, getting into data, and you ha had, um, you know, DSL providers and other providers basically, you know, getting into, um, you know, providing voice over IP and uh, video, you know, over their networks. Um, well, that, that's a, a new innovation that's really coming now, um, and, and, and mobile operators are actually taking a look at that. Um, and so what it basically is, the underlying technology is, is mobile broadcast, so it's, you know, as nutshell, it's, it's, it's multicast IP. Um, and in order to, you know, allow, you know, access to particular multicast channels, um, and, and actually, let me pause there for a quick second. And the key service they're enabling is, is you know, video simulcast, essentially, you know, TV-like services, you know, things like, you know, ESPN News, you know, Bloomberg, um, maybe you're, you're watching Disney channels, whatever it may be, but, you know, essentially manage video content. And that is, you know, some new innovation that's coming um, 
uh, to to mobile operators uh, here in the coming years, where they're essentially going to become you know true triple play providers, where they're providing data, they're providing voice, and they're also basically providing a video service uh, versus an over-the-top service. And so that uh, is predicted to start you know start a little bit last year, a little bit more this year, and really will start to ramp in the coming years as operators uh, roll it out. Um, and there were fits and starts of this in the past using different technology, um, essentially kind of using a over-the-air um, kind of a you know UHF kind of uh, broadcast technology uh, with you know additional antennas on the phone. Um, but that didn't really take off, and this is you know native capabilities that are on phones like Samsungs and you know um, the iPhone 6. And so now we have really uh, a large portion of the population uh, in certain countries have these types of phones. And it's really just a question of um, will the operators be able to get access to the content and, and make the business case work to roll out the service. All right. That's about all the time we have today. I want to thank everyone for attending. Three ways to put your network on the LT on-ramp presented by Sonus. And, and also I want to thank our presenter today, Bill Welch, Product Line Manager of Diameter Solutions at Sonus. Thank you, Bill. Yep, thank you.